Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for the final webinar in the NECAN Industry Webinar Series. I'm Meredith White. I'm Head of Research and Development at Mook Sea Farm, which is an oyster farm and hatchery in Maine. And I'm also chair of the NECAN Industry Working Group, which has put together this webinar series. Uh, the series is designed to share information on how changes to coastal ecosystems, including ocean acidification, are affecting the aquaculture and fishing industries. And today we'll be hearing from Rick Wally, Kurt Brown, and Jessica Waller about how changes to the Gulf of Maine are affecting the iconic American lobster. And these changes are not limited only to ocean acidification. Each presentation will be 10 to 15 minutes with a joint question and answer session at the end. You are welcome to use the question box in the uh, right hand, uh, in the control panel on the right hand of your screen to submit a question during the presentations, but we'll wait to answer them until all three presentations are finished. So before each presenter, I will be introducing them. And so I'm gonna start off by introducing Rick Wally. Rick is a research professor in the School of Marine Sciences and the director of the Lobster Institute at the University of Maine. He's based at the UMaine's Darling Marine Center on the coast. Much of his research integrates the fields of ecology, oceanography, and fishery science towards a better mechanistic understanding of coastal marine populations and communities. For over three decades, Rick has conducted research on the ecology and fisheries of the American lobster. So thanks so much for presenting today, Rick. Meredith, thanks an awful lot for the invitation and a, a huge thank you to the uh, NECAN Working Group for uh, inviting us up, uh, inviting us three here. Um, I just want to make sure everybody's seeing uh, my mm -hmm. screen. Okay, I'm just I just uh, uh, accepted the share screen option. Uh, Great, are, we can see it now. Yes, you can see it now. Okay. Um, good. Well, it's, it is indeed an honor to be here, and I just want to um, uh, give you a quick overview of, of what we'd like to do here. Um, I'll be giving a quick 10-15 um, oh, minute um, overview of the, uh, the, the changes that have occurred in the ecosystem and particularly to uh, the American lobster uh, over the past decades. Um, Kurt will be giving more of a um, uh, a, a um, industry perspective, and um, we'll be talking about uh, Ready Seafood's uh, collaboration with us on some aspects of this research. And then uh, Jessica Waller will be um, giving the final session on her work on uh, ocean warming and acidification effects on larval development and um, and her most recent work on uh, the impacts of warming on uh, the reproductive performance of, of lobsters. So let me just start out uh, with with my session here. And you know, if there's there uh, three thing, let's see. Oh, I'm not. There we go. Um, if there are, there are three things I'd like you to to take away from this from this session here. Um, if it's not already uh, been hammered home to you from various uh, news stories and so forth, um, lobsters here in the Gulf of Maine are, are at um, astronomically historic highs. Uh, and of course, the huge question for the coming years and decades is how long that'll last. Um, we also know that um, dramatic ecosystem change has brought about these uh, brought about these changes, much of them uh, related to human activities, and it's led to this perilous dependency that uh, Maine in particular and Atlantic Canada has on this particular species. Um, and so we're, we're starting to develop uh, predictive tools that we hope will help um, us adapt to uh, these changes and give us the lead time to, to um, to adapt to these changes. Um, but really, our ability to do that depends on an ecosystem level understanding. So I'm going to provide sort of the, the uh, uh, 100,000 foot view here uh, of some of the big changes that have happened over the decades. And then, uh, then Kurt and Jessica will follow up with their, their parts. 
Um, and let's just start here looking at a little more closely at this perilous dependency and do uh, lobsters by the numbers here just to underscore the, the, the importance of this fishery uh, on a national scale. It does happen to be number one uh, in fishery value, both in, in the US and Canada as of uh, about 2015, and that's carried, uh, carried through to, the, uh, to at least through 2017, for which we have records. 90% um, of the US share comes from the Gulf of Maine. 80% of the US share comes from Maine itself. And lobster happens to be Maine's number one export commodity, and about three quarters of Maine's fishery value, uh, all other species considered, comes from lobster itself. And that's shown by this pie diagram here. Uh, again, about 76% of, of Maine's value, fishery value, comes from lobster. And it you know, since this is a, a NECAN webinar and we're interested in acidification effects, it bears mentioning that um, the lobster, along with uh, several other important fisheries, oysters, clams, scallops, even urchins, are all marine calcifiers, only, only underscoring the vulnerability uh, of our fisheries to both warming and acidification. So the question is, how did, how did we get here? Well, let's just look at the history of this um, unprecedented lobster boom. And we have the benefit of the, uh, the federal trawl surveys that NOAA undertakes uh, twice a year to give us a, a, a picture of what's happening. And that's, shown, um, that's been shown by these uh, panels here, each panel representing um, a, a year out of um, geez, uh, uh, 40 plus years of, of data that have been collected during these trawl surveys. But uh, you can see how the, uh, the red hot spot of lobsters has been advancing from north to south over, the, over the, uh, from, sorry, from south to north over the, the decades. And so as of 2015, really the, the hot spot for lobsters was especially the eastern Gulf of Maine and Sco Scotian Shelf area. Um, and so what that's meant for the state of Maine is that uh, our landings, which were um, humming along at about 20 million pounds a year uh, for many years, going as far back as uh, the 1950s, um, in our, around the mid to late 80s really started to take off. And um, and especially so in, in during the 2000s. So 2016 happened to be the the uh, peak year uh, with 533 million dollars uh, worth of landings just in our state al alone, um, and uh, and that is just the the landed value. Um, <clears throat> now. Uh, of course, the big question is, what are the drivers behind this uh, this historic increase? Well, we we know that a couple things have been going on, and we know for sure that, um, uh, especially starting in the the 60s and 70s into the the 80s, we were um, uh, harvesting ground fish in a, at an unprecedented rate and. Unfortunately, the um, management uh, didn't quite keep up with the exploitation of of that those uh, fisheries. And I I just want to emphasize we're we're not just talking about the the iconic ones like cod, but we're really talking about an entire assemblage of uh, of fishes ranging from you know several species of flatfish, halibut, and so forth, haddock, uh, gadids. Um, uh, monkfish and, and others, all of which are important predators, especially on uh, on uh, young small lobsters. And so, what that harvesting has done was to effectively cause the the in, the incredible shrinking uh, fish, if you will, uh, by truncating uh, the size structure of these these ground fish populations, rendering uh, uh, relatively small uh, uh, 
a size structure dominated by small fishes that just do not function as predators as they did uh, uh, when they were in a less exploited state. What that in effect has done is to release lobsters from predation pressure and we see for the state of Maine here how that's dramatically altered the, um, the uh, composition of the catch to the point where lobsters really uh, dramatically dominate and uh, ground fish represent only uh, less than a, a 1% of the, the entire state's um, uh, landings. <clears throat> um, now, that of course is is uh, is a top-down effect to the extent that we we're, we're depleting the the top carnivores from the from the uh, the community. Uh, but of course, we've also have warming effects going on, and um, and since the 1980s and and before, we've seen some of the most dramatic increases in in uh in temperature in the gulf of maine um the most recent decade in fact has seen some of the most rapid uh, increases uh, uh that we're aware of and the gulf of maine happens to be warming according to pershing's work uh and kathy mills work at gmri um is warming faster than uh, most of the world's ocean um <clears throat> now of course you can um, take any segment of of uh, of ten year segment of time here and maybe see a, a lower rate. But these uh, these uh, patterns are are uh, proving to be borne out on a on a global basis, and uh, all pointing to an accelerating um, warming period that that we're entering. Um, and so to zoom in a little more closely on, on the Gulf of Maine and our outlying waters here, um, and think about, and to think about the, the geographic range of the, the American lobster, we, we see that it really, uh, straddles, a, 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 um, the hot and cold thresholds of, uh, of the, um, spe the species, um, uh, thermal tolerance. And this is one of the um, this is one of the the steepest latitudinal gradients in sea surface temperature on the on the planet. If we looked at this on a global scale, our own backyard uh, has has one of the most uh, dramatic um, thermal gradients uh, um, uh, in the world ocean. Uh, so that summer temperatures in the south. Um, that is south of Cape Cod, uh, generally range around the 20s uh, Celsius, um, especially the inland waters of, uh, of uh, say, Narragansett Bay, Cape uh, 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 Long Island Sound, Buzzards Bay, get well into the 20s during during the summer. Um, <clears throat> and uh, whereas in eastern Gulf of Maine and in the Bay of Fundy, we're looking at uh, temperatures that don't get much higher than about uh, uh, 10, 11 degrees. Now, uh, projections have it, and we're already seeing it, that these isotherms are, are moving northward so that um, uh, it's creating increasingly stressful conditions in the south so that we're see we've been seeing increasingly prevalent uh, levels of, of uh, shell disease uh, that's that's really brought on a, a, a high levels of mortality, mass mortalities, and uh, especially off Rhode Island Sound and Buzzards Bay, uh, thermal um, <clears throat> thermal stress to the extent that it's brought, created um, uh, mass mortalities in Long Island Sound, and uh, but at the same time. We're looking at the historical uh, cold areas of the uh, the uh, Gulf of Maine and the Bay of Fundy becoming more hospitable for lobster, and so we've been seeing uh, increasing levels of uh, settlement in larval settlement in especially the eastern Maine and that blue zone along the coast, and uh, and so we're 
in this envelope here of between roughly 20 degrees at the high uh, the, at the high end and uh, 12 degrees at the low end. Um, above 12 degree above 20 degrees, uh, lobsters start being becoming more uh, vulnerable to uh, thermal stress. We again we see the higher levels of of shell disease and um, uh, their physiological system start shutting down. <clears throat> uh, but if you're below 12 degrees, uh, larval development starts suffering, and uh, we just don't see the um, we don't see larvae developing uh, uh, at in time uh, before the the season runs out. So um, we're uh, but with increasing temperatures, we're starting to see um, uh, uh, populations increasing by virtue of higher settlement levels in those eastern zones. So um, we've been working on uh, a number of different protect, pre predictive tools for trends in this in this fishery. And uh, uh, Meredith asked me to talk about um, one of them, but I'll just give you. Uh, uh, sort of a quick preview of, of of the various tools that are being developed. We're we've got everything uh, running from um, uh, predictive tools operating on the scales of of days and months. Uh, that is, uh, for example, uh, Kathy Mills at at um, at GMRI has developed a a, a model. Uh, Predicting the seasonal onset of the uh, essentially the shed that will that um, creates the bump up of harvests in the in each season. Um, so that's at a at a seasonal scale, uh, a monthly scale. Um, on the scale of years, we have um, uh, these larval settlement index based forecast where we're following a a, a year class of settlers through to the harvest. That is, uh, is so that's a predictive tool that's operating on the order of of seven to to ten years, um, <clears throat> and uh, it gives us a sense of uh, uh, of uh, whether we're going to be seeing uh, rises and falls within the time frame of a of a decade. And then we've got the the most recent uh, model that's been developed, um, we're calling it the multi-generational model, and that was led by uh, Arnaud Labrie, who is a postdoc on our uh, on our NSF team. Um, <clears throat> and his work uh, really uh, is probably the most complex to the extent that we're uh, taking in all the, we're considering how environmental changes affect uh, demographic rates such as uh, growth, mortality, reproduction. We're even considering how uh, predator size structure in influences uh, 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 changes in abundance uh, and recruitment. <clears throat> and uh, and we even can uh, start to create what if scenarios with different management tools. So I'll just give you a, a, a few slides here to um, give you a sense of uh, how this model works. First, in the in, uh, I should just add that th this is the list of collaborators here. Um, you know, Andy, uh, Andy Pershing, um, Yang Chen, uh, Kathy Mills, Mike An Alexander, and others. Um, but to just give you a sense of how this model uh, works, essentially we're um, we're comparing the output to a, a, a model based on uh, current conditions. Uh, these, this, the, and we compare that we compare the output, which is uh, given in blue, uh, to the stock assessment. And so that was our, essentially our our validation step. And uh, and so we we'll just start with this. Um, on the right-hand panel of that little bar graph, uh, saying 2014 baseline is uh, is uh, essentially our our benchmark here. And then we can 
do create these what if scenarios um, and say, okay, well, if uh, temperatures stayed at at 1984 to 1999 levels uh, rather than increasing over the decades, uh, what might we have seen? And in fact, uh, in southern New England, we might have seen a more favorable uh, outcome uh, based on based on this model, uh, simply because the the temperatures were in a more um, uh, temperatures were in a more um, uh, 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 favor at at more favorable levels. Um, <clears throat> and then we can create these. We can also create these. Um, what if scenarios of different harvesting strategies, say added protections on egg bearing females. And we see that in the, the red uh, uh, trajectory there, that um, uh, adding uh, protections on, on egg bearing females might've had, um, might have had a, a more positive outcome as well. Um, even with the current levels of, um, of temperature. So the takeaway message here is that um, Southern New England might have benefited from more protections on egg-bearing females uh, <clears throat> if, it had, if it had adopted them uh, earlier. Uh, then we have the Gulf of Maine here. Uh, <clears throat> also, we've got the, the blue uh, trajectory here as being our, our benchmark for the Gulf of Maine compared to the black dots, again, which are the, uh, the stock assessment um, uh, validation. But now we're asking, under if, if temperature stayed uh, at constant 1984 to 1999 levels, uh, what might have happened? Well, since it's colder, we might not have expected the kind of predict uh, production that we, in, in fact, observed. And so that yellow bar is a little lower um, and in fact, if we had removed the protections on eggers, even with the current uh, uh, history of temperatures, um, we would have uh, we would have seen um, uh, even a lower level of of production. So the takeaway here is that uh, the uh, we can essentially by having these uh, protective measures in place we um, were able to uh, benefit from and capitalize on the increasingly favorable conditions. Um, so we, we know we've got uh, uh, different scenarios here for, for the future and what, what does this model project for the future under these different uh, 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 possible trajectories of, of temperature? The range as much as up to uh, four degrees, um, <clears throat> four or five degrees uh, warmer than current uh, conditions. Um, well, we show it here in a in a map following from uh, the 1990s to uh, and into the uh, uh, for 2000. Well, up to about uh, 2050 which is essentially 2050 would be uh, the 2010 to 15 conditions plus one, one and a half degrees. And you see what, it, what amounts to a wave of, of uh, peak levels of lobsters moving from Southern New England and Southern Gulf of Maine into the, the, the Bay of Fundy. So, uh, this is all to say that while there might be we might be suffering at one end, um, it looks as if the Bay of Fundy in eastern Maine may be buffered to some extent against some of these uh, warming temperatures. So just to recap and bring this to to a close, um, we have uh, essentially uh, multiple drivers here, uh, some of them brought on by um, uh, human activity but they amount to both bottom up and top down drivers um that that have uh, dramatically altered the the trajectory of lobster abundance in the the Gulf of Maine um we really have to look at our coast as a dynamic ecosystem altered by humans and uh, you know we've really got to work on uh this dependency uh on one fishery and um we see developing forecasting tools 
as young as that technology still is, as one that gives us the lead time to make choices, and especially one where we're able to um, start to create what-if scenarios to consider uh, how different harvesting strategies and climate scenarios might uh, affect the future of this fishery. So now I'd like to pass the baton on to, to Kurt and Jess. Uh, again, Kurt will be talking about the industry's perspective, our a particular collaboration we're working on on deep water settlement, and then Jess will be talking about ocean warming uh, and acidification effects. Uh, so onward. Oops. Great. Thank you so much, Rick. So um, next we'll be hearing from Kurt Brown. Kurt grew up, grew up in Cape Elizabeth, Maine and started lobstering at eight years old. He has undergraduate degrees in history and biology from Union College and graduate degrees in marine biology and marine policy from the University of Maine. Kurt continues to work as a commercial lobsterman and also works as a marine biologist at Ready Seafood Company, a lobster wholesale and processing company based in Portland. Thanks so much for uh, your presentation today, Kurt. Thank you very much for having me. It's humbling to be here with everyone, to be on a panel with Rick and Jess, and to be here speaking to this webinar. So I just want to start by thanking you all for having me here. Um, as was mentioned, uh, my name is Kurt Brown. I'm a lobsterman out of Cape Elizabeth, Maine. I was actually out on the water yesterday. It's a lot nicer being indoors today than it was at this time yesterday out on the water. So thanks for that. And uh, I also double as a marine biologist at, <coughs> excuse me, at Ready Seafood Company, which is a live lobster wholesale and lobster processing company based in Portland, Maine. Uh, Ready Seafood ships about 15 million pounds of live lobster around the world annually, everywhere from Jay's Oyster Bar and Commercial Street in Portland, Maine, to Shanghai and everywhere in between. Although since right around July 6th, we haven't been shipping quite as many lobsters into China um, due to some tariffs. Um, but uh, we, we, yeah, like I said, ship about 15 million pounds live, and we do about five to seven million pounds of processing every year. That's everything from cooked uh, and picked claw and knuckle meat to frozen tails to frozen whole lobster. So we do all things lobster at Betty Seafood Company. We are fully reliant on the lobster resources of New England and Maritime Canada. And uh, Ready Seafood was founded by my cousins, John and Brendan, who also grew up lobstering like I did in Cape Elizabeth. They were always more interested in where the lobsters were going after the process. I was always more interested in where they were coming from and what was going on below the surface of the ocean. They chose to go into the business of selling lobsters. I always like to joke that I went into the more lucrative business of marine biology. Um, but about four years ago, I was working at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and started a dialogue with my cousins about starting a research component to Ready Seafood and how it could really add value to what we were doing. I came on board. I think a lot of people in the industry thought we were crazy to have a research program at a live lobster wholesale company, but ultimately, as I hope you'll see, it's bared fruit, and it's been a really great experience on a lot of fronts including, and probably most importantly, the collaborations that we've been able to uh, forge with the University of Maine and St. Joseph's College and a lot of other um, top scientists around the world. Uh, our focus for our research program is kind of on two fronts. The first is quality and the second is on sustainability. And that's just the order I'm mentioning them for this presentation. Very quickly, I'll go through our quality priority. So like I said, we ship lobsters all around the world. Last February, during Chinese New Year, over the course of 11 days, we sent almost 800,000 pounds of lobster to China. Um, you can put any lobster in a box and ship it to Shanghai, but unless it's a real high-quality, hard-shell lobster, it won't survive. And ultimately, our quest customers want live lobster. They don't want li dead lobsters in a box. And if you ever wondered how lobsters get boxed up and sent to China, this is about what it looks like. We have slotted cardboard boxes. Put the lobsters in tails for first, claws up, and send them across the world, just like that. But like I said, it has everything to do with quality, and when it comes to lobster, quality is determined by where a lobster is in the molt cycle. 
we have been collaborating with Rick and his team at UMaine for going on three years now, looking at different ways of holding lobsters and improving their quality in the short term, trying to capture some added value for our resource by being able to ship lobsters to more lucrative destinations. Uh, we're currently working on a project with UMaine and St. Joseph's College funded through the Maine Technology Institute to look at to look at just this, and it's a really fun and exciting uh, industry science collaboration. Um, our other priority, and probably our most important priority, is sustainability. As Rick mentioned, uh, Maine in particular, but a good deal of the New England coast and up into Canada is uh, perilously, perilously dependent on our lobster resource. You go to any harbor along the coast of Maine, and this is what you're going to see. Uh, harbors full of lobster boats. Uh, communities full of lobster men and women. Uh, a study out of Colby College this past year said beyond the boat, uh, lobster generates more than a billion dollars at all levels of the supply chain. That is a lot of money depending on just one species. So we really want to improve our understanding of our resource and given the importance of lobster to Maine's marine economy, make sure that um, we know as much as we can going forward. Um, so essentially we're fully reliant on these little guys right here. This is what Rick was referring to when he was talking about a settler or a young of the year. This is about a one month old lobster that's just recently settled down to the bottom. That billion dollar number is fully reliant on these little guys surviving to adulthood and crawling into traps up and down the coast. So what do we know about these little guys? Well, most of what we know is, is from Rick's lab going back 30 years. Um, the American Lobster Settlement Index is a collaboration between a number of organizations looking at the distribution and abundance and how that changes year to year of these little critters. Uh, two different survey methods. Uh, the one that's been going on for much longer is the suction sampling method, as you can see on the right of your screen. That requires scuba divers and scuba tanks and pretty cool underwater vacuum, uh, essentially uh, surveying lobster nursery habitat. Because it's diver based, it's limited to about 30 feet and shallower. We have some pretty amazing time series data going back a long time uh, that shows some pretty compelling trends. On the left, you'll see what we call a lobster settlement collector. These can be set in deeper water and give us an indicator of what settlement is looking like in the deeper waters beyond uh, what scuba can survey. Um, let's see here. So as you can see, there's huge spatial coverage of both of these sampling methods. Basically from Rhode Island all the way up to Newfoundland, we have either collectors or suction sampling sites going back years. And so it's pretty amazing to see how over time this has really expanded and the collaborative now includes organizations, like I said, from Rhode Island all the way up into Canada and has shed, really set, shed some light on some interesting patterns. Um, so if we look at some data from uh, the suction sampling survey going back, like I said, in some sites 30 years, uh, we are pretty much at all time lows in terms of settlement. And this is despite egg production being at an all time high. If we look at the number of egg bearing fe females from the main, main DMR's bentless trap survey, we'll, we'll see that you know egg production is at an all time high and settlement rates in shallow waters along the coast seem to be at an all time low. And I believe this is a pattern that uh, Rick and his collaborators call the great disconnect. You know, what, what is happening in between egg production and settlement? Well, it could be a number of different things, but um, two come to mind, either one, lobster larvae are not surviving, or potentially as waters warm along the coast of Maine, they're just settling in deeper water. And fortunately, three years ago, Sea Grant funded a proposal that Rick put in to look at that second option, to look at how set lobster settlement varies by depth. And this is straight from his proposal here. Um, this industry science collaboration focuses on the influence of temperature on lobster settlement across two distinct regions in three depth strata. 
We are comparing data from Casco Bay, where the water column stratifies in the summer, to eastern Maine, where it does not. This allows us to test the hypothesis that both the along shore temperature gradient and the thermocline strongly influence both settlement and older juvenile distributions. So as you can see, when this project was funded, um, myself and Ready Seafood were fortunate to be uh, asked to be collaborators, myself as a, a vessel captain who deploys these collectors and hauls them back in the fall, and Ready Seafood as a collaborator humping rocks from uh, quarries along the coast to Ready Seafood's facility and onto my boat. Um, as you can see, surface temperatures in western Maine are much warmer than they are in eastern Maine. But if you go down to uh, down to depth, because of the stratification in western Maine, the temperatures at depth are actually colder and below that 12 degree threshold that Rick was talking about during his presentation. Whereas in eastern Maine, surface temperatures are a bit colder. But as you go down, because the waters are well mixed, at depth, the water is warmer in eastern Maine. So we've seen some interesting patterns. The results you see here are from the first two years of this project. And what we see in Casco Bay is higher settlement rates at our shallow depth strata and a big drop off in both our mid and deep depth strata. So settlement seems to be occurring mostly in our shallow or warm waters in western Maine. And then if you go to eastern Maine, settlement essentially seems to be uh, at least statistically comparable uh, at all three depth strata, shallow, mid, and deep. And this would correspond with water temperatures in each of these regions. So that's a really interesting two-year kind of preliminary pattern that we've seen from this project. And now the real interesting part of this is that after two years, because this was a two-year project funded from Sea Grant, this would have been the end of the project. And uh, my cousin Brendan, last February, when uh, when we were wrapping up and getting results together, said, well, how much does it cost to keep this project going? Like, this is useful data. We're a lobster company. We need to know what's going on. We've seen landings shift significantly from inshore to offshore. It would make sense that more lobsters are settling offshore. Can we keep this project going? And so I gave him a number, and he said, all right, well, Ready Seafood is going to continue funding this project now. We need this information. We're going to be the first public company to fund I'm sorry, the first private company to fund public research. And I was thrilled, I was blown away. And it's been a really exciting collaboration the first two years. And since we've taken over funding this past year, it's been really great. Um, it got our entire team involved. As you can see right here, this project filling these collectors starts with the rock quarry. And this is the Ready Seafood team along with the UMaine team filling 120 collectors that got set out all throughout Casco Bay. We had our collaborators up in Cutler doing the same thing in Eastern Maine. But from our perspective as a lobster company, this has been about the best thing to happen to us uh, as a team that we can remember. It got our entire team jazzed about science, which is not an easy thing to do. So uh, for that, you know, it's we're really thankful that we were involved from the start and we couldn't be any prouder to be involved going forward. Um, it's really turned into a model for industry funding for science, and it's really, believe it or not, a valuable tool for our sales team to be able to tell customers about the research projects that we're involved in. So I'm sure you're all familiar with suction sampling, but with these collectors, maybe not as much. So how do we get these collectors into the water, and how do they work? Well, like I said, it starts by going to the rock quarry, as you can see right here, and filling them up. Because this is a research project, funds are limited, so we use as much child labor as we can. This is my three-year-old son, Finn, helping us out right here. Um, then we load them onto a flatbed, get them to ready seafood, load them on my boat. And here are our sites in Casco Bay from last year. We set them out in those three different depth strata I was talking about. Essentially, 0 to 10 fathoms, 10 to 20 fathoms, and 20 to 30 fathoms are our three different depth strata. They're set out in June at the beginning of hatching season for lobster. And then... We haul them back at uh, the end of settlement season, which is usually October, but with weather this year, we're looking, we were uh, backed up well into November, and I believe the UMaine crew, and Rick can confirm this, just wrapped up last week, finishing up in eastern Maine. So what do we find? 
Well, these are the little guys right here. This is from literally a month ago today out on my boat. We found this settler. This was actually our first settler that we found in our deep depth, deep depth strata um, off of Casco Bay. So that's why Rick has a big smile on his face right there, despite the cold. Um, but ultimately, Ready Seafood is proud to partner with you, Maine and Maine DMR to improve our understanding of Maine's lobster resource. Um, like I said, myself and John and Brendan grew up lobster and lobsters in our blood and we have a passion for everything lobster. If you don't believe me, you can watch this video right here. This is from a year ago and uh, this is John and Brendan, the owners of Ready Seafood and John Levitt, one of our salesmen. And this is literally what they do and what we do for fun in our spare time. Apologies for any expletive deleted, but I think it's uh, worth showing. Holy shit. Holy shit, dude. Look at how small that is. Look at that. Holy shit. That's a settler. Oh, you see a lot? Yeah, that's a settler. We're going to let him go. Smallest lobster yeah. I've ever seen. I'm going to put him in the corner. Yeah. He's, he's smaller than all these. That's They call these settlers. Good. No, he's not. Put him down. Let's see what happens. You know, he's going to swim in. I'd say we put him in the aquarium to give it. Actually, Kurt's out there. there. So I was going to talk more about some of the other species we've been seeing more and more of in our traps here in Maine. We see some black sea bass, some trigger fish, but I'll leave that for the question and answer session at the end. I know we're running short on time here and I want to leave Jess enough time to get through her presentation. So thank you very much. Happy to ask, answer questions later on. Great, thank you so much, Kurt. So Jessica Waller is a lobster biologist for the Maine Department of Marine Resources in West Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. Her research focuses on biological questions related to management of Maine's lobster fishery. She graduated from the University of New Hampshire with a BS in marine and freshwater biology and completed her master's in marine biology at the University of Maine. Over the past few years, she's worked at several research institutions in Maine, including uh, the UMaine Darling Marine Center and Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. And today she'll be talking about her master's research focused on lobster larvae and um, on, uh, excuse me, and on some of the work that she is currently doing at DMR. So thank you, Jess. All right, thanks for that introduction, thanks. Meredith. Uh, and thanks for Kurt and Rick uh, on those great presentations. Today, uh, I'd like to give a really brief overview on two of the projects that I've been involved in the past couple of years, uh, really focused on how changing conditions in the Gulf of Maine impact lobsters at different life stages and over different scales of time. So first, I'll just give a really brief uh, overview of the work I did for my master's thesis, um, since I've discussed this uh, with NECAN and other groups before. Um, and this really focused on how lobster larvae through their development, so those four larval stages you see in front of you, how they'll respond to rising temperatures and increasing PCO2. And this was really a collaborative effort between uh, UMaine and the Darling Center, uh, as well as Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences and the University of Prince Edward Island. So this work was really focused around a larval rearing experiment I completed in the summer of 2015. So at Bigelow Laboratory, uh, I raised thousands of lobster larvae in a two-factorial experiment. I raised them at the temperature and PCO2 they might have experienced off the coast of Maine in 2015, uh, as well as the temperature and PCO2 we think they might experience at the end of the century, the year 2100. So that's reflected by a three-degree increase in temperature and a doubling of PCO2 to 750 parts per million. For each one of my four treatments, I raised larvae in six tanks, Half of the tanks, all of those larvae were dedicated just to the measurement of larval survival over this time period. We really didn't want to handle those larvae too much. While the rest of the larvae were used for a series of measurements uh, to examine their development and physiology. So during each of the four larval stages, uh, I completed all of these measurements, including length, oxygen consumption rate, uh, as well as dry mass. During that final larval stage, commonly known as the post-larval stage, I also uh, took measurements for swimming speed, feeding rates, and we preserved larvae 
to look at differential gene expression. As you might imagine, uh, from a an experiment with this many measurements, we saw a lot of significant results and trends. But for the purpose of today, I'd just like to give a very broad overview of our conclusions and takeaways, but I'd be happy to talk about it in more detail later on. So one of the biggest things we found is that temperature, and not necessarily PCO2 treatment, was the driver of larval survival, development, and physiology, as we found that larvae raised in that end century temperature had lower rates of survival, faster development times, and increased rates of oxygen consumption, regardless of the PCO2 treatment. We also saw several places where there was an interactive effect in our end century temperature in PCO2, including our measurements of larval size and swimming speed. And our preliminary results show us that PCO2 had a significant effect on differential gene expression, with larvae raised in that end century PCO2 significantly upregulating genes related to stress response and downregulating genes connected to exoskeleton formation. So uh, much of this work is still underway by the University of Maine Bigelow team um, and new grad student, or not so new grad student at this point, <laughs> uh, Maura Nemosto. Um, so look forward to hearing more about that in the next couple of years. So now I'd like to shift gears uh, somewhat dramatically, but really um, staying on the theme and lobsters and changing conditions and talk about the work currently underway at the Department of Marine Resources in West Deep Bay Harbor. So this is a study we began this year um, that's really a continuation of DMR's ongoing lobster research program to look at the carapace length at which female lobsters reach sexual maturity. So this is the size at which they can start producing eggs. So this topic has been of interest to the department really for some time. There's been a lot of published work, uh, especially recently, from across the lobster's historic range, showing that female lobsters are reaching maturity at a smaller and smaller size over the scale of the last few decades. This is validated by the observations of industry members uh, who keep seeing smaller and smaller egg-bearing egg females in their traps over time. So because of this, and it's important to the whole stock assessment model, which we'll discuss a little bit later on, female size at maturity was listed as a research priority in the 2015 stock assessment for the American lobster. Now this downward shift in size at maturity has been attributed to a suite of factors, including uh, fishing pressure, intensifying fishing pressure, as well as dramatically rising temperatures. And this is really important for us in Maine to consider, since the last time the department conducted the female size at maturity study that feeds the stock assessment model was in the mid 90s. And we know that both uh, temperatures and fishing pressure has changed rapidly over that 25 or so year period. So historically, DMR has done two size and maturity studies, uh, both focused on uh, females from our inshore region. So that's zero to three nautical miles for our purposes. The study done in the 60s focused on females from the Booth Bay Harbor area, so mid-coast Maine. Uh, and the study in the 90s, and you can see the sampling map from that study on your right, sampled females from across Maine's coast. And this study revealed that females in Maine reach sizes at maturity. Their size at maturity depends on their harvest location. So females from Cape Porpoise, the western coast of Maine, reach maturity a smaller size uh, than females collected from Stonington, Maine, so that eastern coast of Maine. Uh, so we see some differences along the coast of Maine there. So really, with all of this in mind, we set out uh, to study three research questions over the next three or so years. So given the historical richness of our data set out of Booth Bay Harbor, we wanted to study those Booth Bay Harbor females again this year to see how that specific group has changed over time. We also wanted to know what the size of maturity is for females in our offshore region, so greater than three miles, um, since as Kurt and Rick uh, have talked about, more and more of the fisheries moving offshore. And finally, really reflecting uh, the findings that study or the DMR study had in the 90s, we want to look at coastal differences. So uh, for our purposes, over the next couple years, we'll be sampling uh, females from along Maine's coast as a function of NIMS statistical areas 512, 511, and 513. So really just three different sections of the coast. So this year, we started by sampling females out of the Booth Bay Harbor region. So we sampled uh, from mid-May to the end of June, and we collected 273 females from Booth Bay Harbor and 273 females from an adjacent offshore area. So as you can see, 
um, from this size frequency plot here. We also collected a very broad range, uh, size range of females. So we collected females from 55 to 110 millimeters carapace length. This means that we collected and processed a total of 546 females over that six week period. So once a female was collected for our work and brought back into the lab, we began a three part analysis. So we recorded a lot of information about, of course, how the female was collected, and then took a series of external measurements, including, of course, carapace length. We would then remove the carapace uh, to examine the color and the condition of the ovary. So on the left side of your screen is a female with immature ovaries. You can see they're quite small and white. Uh, and on the right-hand side, that's a female with mature ovaries that would be ready to produce eggs. So we noted that, as well as uh, weighed the ovaries, and looked at some other features connected to previous egg extrusion or spawning activity. Next, we would remove those developing eggs, the oocytes, from the ovary and photograph them so we could determine their diameter in image J. We'd also remove a pleopod, so that's one of those appendages that hangs under the tail, uh, and look at the development of features associated either with spawning or with molting. It's important to have an understanding of both of those processes since they're really connected in female lobsters. Once a female reaches maturity, she will alternate between molting one year and spawning the next. So growing and reproducing, growing and reproducing. Um, so to have an accurate understanding uh, of both is really important for this kind of work. So with all of these different types of measurements for each female, we were then able to go in and make a maturity determination for all of those 500 plus females. So after those determinations, we grouped them into five millimeter size groups and calculated the proportion mature. So what percent of females were mature from 50 to 60 millimeter, or 55 to 60 millimeters carapace length, and so on. We then took those observed proportion mature and fit them with the function that you'll see below. And that let us calculate our maturity ogive. So that's a line that lets you see the probability that a female is mature at a given carapace length. So here's what those curves look like for this year. On the x-axis, we have carapace length. On the y, proportion mature. The filled circles represent the females we collected from Booth Bay this year. And the open circles are uh, females we collected from the offshore region this year. The solid line is, again, inshore females dashed offshore females. So we can see that they're quite similar, and there, were not, there was not a statistically significant difference between them. But as we've discussed, there's really a long sampling history of this type in the Booth Bay Harbor region. So now that we have this, we can compare that to DMR's previous work. So this is the same type of plot. So that solid line is the work done by DMR in the 60s and 70s. The dotted is in the 90s. The dashed is the collections we did this year in our inshore area, dashed and dotted, the collections we did this year in our offshore area. So looking at all of that together, we can see that females are reaching maturity at a smaller and smaller carapace length over this uh, half 50 year period or so. So alongside this, there are also some additional points of comparison we can look at to examine changes over time. So for this table, uh, on that left hand side, the sampling period is the years when uh, DMR researchers were actively sampling uh, female lobsters in the Booth Bay Harbor area. So starting in 1968 and then concluding with our work this year. So we can look at the L50 value. So that's the length at which 50% of females reach maturity. So looking from 1968 to 2018, we see a 10 millimeter decrease in that L50 value. So really uh, quite a change there. This is supported by the number of females that were classified as mature in each one of our studies. All three of these studies use the same classification system for mature or immature and sampled a pretty similar size range and had a pretty equal sample size. And you'll see that the percentage classified as mature increased from 12.8 to 21.7 to 38.9. So more and more mature females sampled during these studies. So there's a well-established relationship between temperature and size at maturity. So given that relationship, we wanted to look at how sea surface temperatures had changed in Booth Bay Harbor over this uh, sampling period. So this is the same type of table uh, with that, those sampling years on the left 
for our most recent work, which was all completed in 2018, we wanted to look at changes in sea surface temperatures over the last six years, as this is the time period when the lobsters we sampled would have been growing and developing. So we use DMR sea surface temperature data. DMR has been recording temperatures in the harbor for uh, well over a century. So we started by looking at the average number of days for each one of those sampling periods when the average sea surface temperature exceeded six degrees Celsius, as it's been observed that temperatures above this point can sustain ovarian and reproductive development. So as we might expect, the number of days where the average sea surface temperature exceeded six uh, is increasing over time. We also wanted to look at the occurrence of a more extreme high temperature, more unusual for this area. So we selected to look at the number of days where the maximum sea surface temperature exceeded 20 degrees Celsius. As uh, Rick alluded to, this temperature can have detrimental effects on uh, ovarian development, larvae, and other processes. So the number of days where the maximum sea surface temperature in our area exceeded 20 jumped from 6.2 to 20.14 um, over that roughly 25 year time period. So to put all of this together, we saw that the size at maturity of female lobsters has been uh, decreasing over this 50 or so year time period. We also saw that Booth Bay Harbor and the surrounding area has been warming and that those extreme potentially deleterious temperatures are occurring more and more frequently over the last two or three decades. It's important to have an updated understanding of the size at maturity uh, because that number actually feeds into several different parameters of the stock assessment model. So for example, that value feeds into the growth transition matrices that underlie the model which tells us about the probability that a female will grow in a given year, so that she'll molt. Uh, it also goes into spawning stock biomass, which tells us about the reproductive health of the stock. Um, so both ties into that stock assessment model there. And finally, since Maine's uh, management and conservation measures are based around the length, minimum, maximum size of harvested lobsters, as well as the conservation of mature females through V-notching, um, hopefully, all of this work can be used to better inform and update conversations around those management efforts in the future. So with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you to uh, everyone here at DMR who really got this off the ground this year. Um, we got a lot of help uh, and insights from both Dr. Tracy Pugh, Dr. Susan Waddy, uh, and our work was sponsored by the Lobster Research Education and Development Fund here at DMR. Uh, and with that, I'd love to hear from you and take any questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, for those of you who can stick around, even though it's now three o'clock, we'll, we'll do a short question and answer session. So uh, please feel free to enter questions into the question box on the right, on the control panel on the right side of your box. We have a question from Joe Salisbury, which is for uh, Rick Wally. Joe says, I did not pick up on the definition of abundance. Uh, so in the graphs that we're showing lobster abundance, Rick, and then he also asks, is, is it lobster biomass? And then when you're talking about the Gulf of Maine, does that include Canadian waters? Uh, hold on, great, okay. Okay. Rick, did you did you hear the, the I, question? I got the question. Do I do I have uh, do I have audio? Yes. Uh, so, uh, Joe, the the short answer to your question um, in terms of abundance, if you're referring to the uh, Labrie paper, that that would be biomass, as is expressed in the um, the, the stock assessment. So they're the same terms used in, in the stock assessment and. Um, uh, well, yeah, our uh, model does extend in, into the Canadian parts of the, the Gulf of Maine um, that uh, uh, the, the map that was presented uh, again from the uh, Labrie paper um, uh, includes the shelf waters from southern New England into the uh, southern Gulf of St. Lawrence, but the real focus is the Gulf of Maine. 
Great, thank you. We have another question for you, Rick, from Beth Turner. Um, the comparison of model results to stock assessment in Maine diverged around 2005. The model showed higher levels than the stock assessment. What was going on at that time? Uh, that, that's a very good question, Beth. And uh, I would have to defer to, um, to uh, Arnaud Labrie, the, the author of the model, to um, know exactly what was going on with some of those divergences. Um, but the overall uh, time trajectory is a pretty close match. Um, so um, good question, but I'm sorry I can't answer that particular one. Okay. I have a, a question for Kurt. Uh, Kurt, as a lobsterman, what are your biggest environmental concerns for the lobster industry? And where would you rank ocean acidification on the list of environmental concerns? It's a very good question. Um, in terms of ranking, I'm not sure I can put a number next to these, but I would say warming water, especially near the surface, um, impacting lobster larvae. Uh, as we go forward, we're getting you know, near some of those ranges where lobster larvae start to get stressed and may not survive. So I think that would be probably one of the most important concerns going forward. And that's why we see the research we're doing is so important. And some of the newer research that DMR and UMaine are doing uh, at, at, at larval stages uh, is really important and will shed some interesting light on what's going on. Um, Influx of predators from southern New England, as Rick alluded to, uh, we the lobster um, spans one of the biggest uh, thermal gradients in the world, and if you go down to southern New England, you see an abundance of a whole slew of predators that we didn't see here and now are seeing more and more, and research that's been done in the past has shown that some of those predators can have a good influence, a good big negative influence on uh, lobster survival. So keeping an eye on that and ocean acidification is a big threat going forward and it's really important that groups like this continue to do the type of research that sheds light on the impact of ocean acidification on lobsters at different life stages because um, there's a lot of unknowns there and the more information uh, we have the better for everybody. So I would say in a nutshell, those are the three things that I see going forward as threats to our industry. And, you know, it's a global problem, but we can arm ourselves with information and that's what we need to do most. Great, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Jess too. Um, as you see the uh, size of female lobsters reaching maturity decline, what do you think would be the most effective management strategy to preserve those reproductive um, females, at, like for potentially having their ovaries mature before eggs have uh, been released, where then the fishermen could do the V-notch? Sure. Um, well, I think something uh, noting right off the bat is that Ideally, the minimum size, I think, in the past has been set around that L50 value so that, uh, at least hypothetically, most females get to reproduce at least once uh, before reaching harvest size. I guess it's not C notched. Um, and the minimum size now, I believe, is uh, 82.5 millimeters. <laughs> is somebody doing the math in my head right? Uh, and the L50 value we found this year uh, was quite close to that, so 84 millimeters. Um, so I think, if anything, it shows that that, uh, that conservation measure has been quite effective. Great, thank you. Well, thank you to our three panelists today, and thank you to all of the attendees. Uh, this webinar will be posted on the NECAN website for uh, viewing at a later date for those who missed the webinar today. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, and have a good afternoon.